Although the topic will be about new materials, I would like to start with a very old material. I picked up some material here on the campus, this stone, and I would like to ask you, what is it made of? Just shout me your answers. What do you think this stone is made of? Louder, please. There will probably be silicon in it, but can you be more specific? I would say if you look at this stone from a very general point of view, what is inside is nuclei and electrons. That answer is always right for whatever stone you have. We have a collection of about 100 nuclei in nature. 30, 40 appear regularly. So these are inside this stone. And electrons, every electron is the same. So these are also inside. These few particles, 30, 40 nuclei plus electrons, they make all the properties of that stone. How hard it is, how heavy it is, what is the color, how uncompressible it is. Maybe, well, it's not conducting, so that's also a property due to this particular combination of nuclei and electrons. And humanity has learned how to use these properties of materials. Stones, you can use that in engineering. People can build constructions out of stone, and you really benefit there from the properties of that stone. The incompressibility is one reason why you can build the gate of this university out of stones. That's just one material, stone. But nature has other materials for us. Wood, for instance. Made by exactly the same particles. A few nuclei and electrons. And yet the properties are completely different. In this wood, I can slightly bend it. I would probably, yeah, I was even able to break it. That would not have been possible with that stone. And yet it's with the same particles. So you would take different types of nuclei, arrange them in different ways, and you have something with completely different properties. Humanity also learned how to use wood. You can also make constructions out of wood, the gate of the botanical garden. And if you would ask the engineers who have built this gate and the ones who have built the gate of the university, they will have needed to do very different things to build a wooden gate or to build a stone gate. The properties of these materials are very, very different. But their constituents are always the same, nuclei and electrons. Nature has more surprises for us. Nature has more materials than just stone and wood. If you take look at this mineral, iron 304, an iron oxide, that's magnetite, a naturally occurring mineral that is magnetic. That stone was not magnetic, that wood was not magnetic. This material is magnetic. According to history as we tell it in Europe. Magnetite was discovered by a Greek shepherd who was walking with a stick that had an iron pin at the bottom. And then suddenly he felt that his stick got stuck to a rock. And that was a rock made of magnetite. Of course, you know that Chinese people have discovered magnetite much before the Greeks in Europe. But well, that's not what we tell to our children. Humanity has, always lear has also learned how to make use of the properties of that material. And here I can use a Chinese illustration. The compass is a technological innovation building on the magnetic properties, not of magnetite, but in this case of lodestone. You make this spoon object out of lodestone. You put it on a plate where it can rotate without much friction and it will turn in the direction of the magnetic north pole. Nuclei and electrons, very different properties, and you build a technology on top of that. 
someone mentioned silicon a few minutes ago. Well, silicon dioxide is another naturally occurring mineral known to humanity since a long, long time. But around the 19th century, people discovered that this material had another very new property, one that you could never have imagined. It's piezoelectric. If you press on it, there will be a spontaneous separation of charges inside the material. And the other way around, if you put uh, a voltage across it to induce that charge separation, it will deform, it will bend or extend or compress. And again, you can build a technology on top of that. People used these quartz crystals to make a new type of watches. Watches that had no mechanical properties any longer, but where a quartz oscillator that was driven by a small battery can be a very precise instrument for timekeeping. So humanity always makes technologies based on these surprising new properties of materials. And if you look through history, I would say that the imagination of nature to invent new properties has always been richer than our human imagination. Nobody would have thought that something as magnetism or piezoelectricity would have been possible. Very often, if you think from the point of view of an engineer or even as a scientist, the property of the the need to find a material with the right properties, that is the bottleneck for any innovation. If you look at the problems we have today, if you would find a material that is superconducting at room temperature, well, imagine what, what new things you can do with that as an engineer, how many problems of society you can help solving with this. Imagine that you find something that is an ideal thermoelectric material, imagine what you can do with that. Even in your own research, maybe you need to detect one kind of radiation and you would need some scintillator crystal that has the ideal properties to detect that particular radiation. Well, your bottleneck is finding that material with those properties. So finding materials with the right properties, that is where most of our research in one way or another is about. And then we can wonder how many of such materials, of such new materials, has nature still available for us? When we search for new materials or materials with new properties, are we then fishing in a very small piece of water? Or do we have still a very large collection of undiscovered materials in front of us? The answer to that question is vital for the future of humanity. If we have discovered already all materials or almost all materials that can exist, then the technology which we have today is the technology that will be with us for the rest of humanities. If, on the other hand, we can hope that there are still zillions of new materials potentially available, then we can dream about many new technologies that today not yet exist. So that's a first question I would like to discuss with you. Are we in the first situation, few set of undiscovered materials, or in the second, a large set? If I ask you that question here, how many materials, and I will limit myself a little bit now, I will not ask about materials in general, but just about crystalline materials. How many crystalline materials do you think we have already discovered in the history of mankind? Could you put a number on that? Just an order of magnitude, no precise number, of course. How many? Several thousand. Several thousands. That's one guess or one estimate. Who thinks less? Who thinks more? It's much more. If you look in databases of crystallographic data, you can find some of them even for free on the web, then you will have a collection there of about 200,000 crystals. 200,000 crystals have been described by crystallographers. 
that's a lot, but that's not tremendously many. Now, is that the maximal amount of crystals that does exist, or can we find more of them? Is there still room to improve? And that's a difficult question to discuss in the real world in which we are. So I would like for a while to descend into a simplified world. And I will ask that question in that simplified world. And from what we learn in the simplified world, we will understand the real world. In the real world, if I say crystal, then I mean something that has a particular chemical formula, like this silicon dioxide, and also a particular, particular crystal structure. It can be alpha quartz, it can also be beta quartz, or many, many other silicon dioxide crystal structures. In my simplified world, I will forget about crystal structures. I will identify crystals only by their chemical formula. So there is only one silicon dioxide crystal in my simplified world. And I will simplify this even more. I will only consider chemical formula that have always index one. So sodium chloride, one sodium, one chlorine atom, that's a crystal that exists in my simplified world, while titanium dioxide does not exist because there is an index two with the oxygen. And now we have a very simple situation. Now we can really calculate by formula how many of these crystals can potentially exist. Because that is just a matter of combinatorics. You search for all groups of n elements you can form out of the 90 elements you have commonly available. So I search all combinations of 90 elements in groups of n. And I have plotted here on a graph where on the horizontal axis we have all the elements from one hydrogen here up to 90. And on the vertical axis, on a logarithmic scale, I plot the number of combinations. And if you look at that, so even in our simplified world that must have less crystals than in the real world, I find enormous numbers. The maximum of this curve is around crystals with 45 different elements, and there can potentially be 10 to the power 24 of them. That's an enormous number if you compare it to the 200,000 real crystals we know. But that's strange. Hmm? I know in my real world many crystals with two elements, with three elements, some with four or five elements, but I can't imagine one crystal with 10 different elements, let alone crystals with 45 different elements. And yet, these should be really the dominant ones. So where are they? Where are all these crystals that can potentially exist? Well, in order to answer that question, we have to look at another criterion for the existence of crystals. It's not sufficient that you can combine these elements in a particular crystal structure or in a, here in a particular chemical formula in my simplified world. It should also be the case that there is no decomposition of that crystal possible that has a lower energy. If I take the example of a crystal in my simplified world with three elements, A, B, and C, that crystal will only exist if splitting the crystal in a new crystal with elements A and B and another new crystal with element C, if that new crystal has a higher energy than the original one. And not only that crystal should have a higher energy, also this one should have a higher energy, this one and splitting in three individual crystals. All these combinations must have higher energies in order to be sure that the crystal ABC will exist. If one of them has a lower energy, the crystal will spontaneously disintegrate into this lower energy situation. How many of these conditions do we have? In this case, the four which I listed there are the only combinations that are possible. 
And for luck, mathematicians have studied that question long ago. So mathematicians have expressions to calculate for any string of numbers, n numbers, what are the possible divisions, the possible sets and subsets you can make out of n numbers. And that quantity is called the Bell number. So what we have here is the Bell number of three elements, all possible set and subset combinations you can make with three elements, and that Bell number is five. The original set at the top and these four here. So the number of conditions we need in order to be sure that our crystal ABC exists is the Bell number minus one. So our four conditions here. Let's now plot that Bell number as a function of the number of elements in the crystal. I have that here on this graph, on the same graph as before. The Bell number is that blue line. And you see that this number, it's a logarithmic scale, don't forget, that this Bell number rises dramatically. For 90 elements, the Bell number of 90 elements is 10 to the power 96 sets. Let's now look to the case with 45 different elements. So we have 10 to the power 24 possible crystals. And the Bell number for 45 elements is 10 to the power 40. That means in order for one of these crystals with 45 elements in order to exist, there must be satisfied 10 to the power 40 different stability conditions. If one of them is not satisfied, then the crystal disintegrates and cannot exist. So 10 to the power 40 conditions, that's a lot. And it's highly unlikely that all of them indeed will be fulfilled. So that's the reason why we don't meet these crystals in nature. There are so many conditions that it's impossible in practice to satisfy them. The crystals that do exist in nature are the ones with just a few elements, because there you have many potential, uh, many potential candidates and only few conditions that need to be satisfied. And somewhere in this region, there will be a crossover. The requirement by the Bell number will become more demanding than what the existing combinations can offer. Nobody at this time knows where that crossover will happen. We, are, we know examples of crystals with four and five elements. Not that many, but we know them. There are very few examples of crystals with, with six and seven elements. But is that because they just have not been searched for yet? Or is that because we are in that transition zone that we cannot tell for sure? So now we have understood why in that simple world our crystals are simple. They have only a few elements, but the same argument is true in the real world as well. So let's go back to the real world and continue our story there. So the conclusion up to this point is there will probably, we are not sure, but there will probably still many crystals that are not discovered yet, many more than the 200,000 we know, and it's likely that we will find them in the region with four or five different elements, perhaps more. Now, how do scientists and engineers search for such new materials? The method that has been used almost exclusively in the history of mankind is symbolized here by this picture of Edison, who was a champion of that method, the hunt and try method. You have a particular problem. You look into the literature to find as much information about that problem as you can. Based on that information, you identify a set of possible materials that can solve your problem as much as you can imagine. And then, one by one, you start doing experiments to identify the material that best suits the solution to your problem. That is how the old type of light bulbs have been invented, for instance.
Hunt and try. That same strategy has been used to discover this 200,000 crystals that we know of. And what you see here is a historical overview as a function of time, for, as a function of year. For every year, they show here the number of new crystals that have been discovered that year. And crystallography has started in the beginning of the 20th century. X-ray diffraction was invented then. So you see that from then on, up to about 100 crystals per year have been discovered. Here you have the Second World War. Scientists had other things to do than discovering new crystals, so there is a dip here. And after the Second World War, then it exploded. And nowadays we discover, well, considerably more than 1,000 new crystals per year. So the integral of this curve that gives you this 200,000 dead crystals that we know. But you can imagine that if the pool of undiscovered crystals is an order of magnitude larger, that it will still take centuries before you really have discovered all existing crystals. The hunt and try method is a very slow method. So we need to speed that up. And the experimental people are aware of that. So there is a class of techniques known as high throughput experimentation that tries to speed crystal discovery up. And we know high throughput dis um, experimentation best in the context of chemistry. In chemistry labs, you will find this type of robots where a robot can mix two types of a uh, few types of liquids in all possible concentrations at once. So every tube is automatically filled by a different combination of a few liquids. And then there is a measuring machine that can do experiments on all of these liquids, either rapidly one after the other or simultaneously. A lot of measurement machines that just simultaneously measure the whole stock. Completely automated. And one such robot can do in one day more experiments than one human being could do in an entire career. And that speeds up chemistry research a lot. We know some, several of similar things also in material science. I have taken here a randomly chosen example from the recent literature, where people study different alloys of nickel, aluminum and manganese made by sputtering these three elements on one wafer. And you have chosen the focus of the three beams in such a way that you have a varying gradient of nickel, aluminum and manganese concentrations across the wafer. So by one sample production step, you have these different points in the ternary phase diagram of these three elements. And if you then have an X-ray diffraction machine that can make very focused experiments, you can then scan all these dots on your wafer to find, for instance, the crystal structure and the lattice parameters of all these different phases in the phase diagram works very efficiently for that particular purpose, but you are limited to studying, in this case, three different elements. It would be very hard to do that with 20 different elements. And it's also limited to the elements for which you have sputter beams. You, if you want to study the same thing with, what should I say, krypton, inside the crystal, well, it will not be easy to find a machine that can do that for you. So if you want to vary the elements in a rapid, in an automated way, that's not so easy experimentally. And that's where computation comes into play. Because we have also things as high throughput computation. And I will show you two different variants of high throughput computation. So this number one here is for the first variant which is not something we do ourselves, but which is done by a team of many different groups in the US mainly. It's called the Materials Project. It's the name of a project, of a consortium, and also of a website. And there is this materialsproject.org. What do they do there? 
they take all these 200,000 experimentally known crystals, and for each of them, they do a DFT calculation. In a standardized way, such that the energies you get from all of these DFT calculations are comparable to each other. That is organized in a database, which is online available. So this is the view you will see if you go to that website. And you can now ask questions to that database. You can say, show me all calculations you have for alloys that contain iron, copper, and silicon. Iron, copper, and silicon um, that have at most four different elements. So there is one extra element allowed. They should have a band gap between two and four electron volts, and their formation energy should be within these limits. So you can ask that type of question, and you will get the answer back from the database. You don't have to do a DFT calculation yourself. These calculations have been done already and the database just collects them. So this is a way of speeding up working with materials computationally. Some groups do all the work for you, for the known crystals, and you can just interrogate them on, about the questions you are interested in. It's a kind of parallel computation, but you don't have to do the parallelism yourself. It's already done for you. This would be a good time to say a few words about the underlying methods that have been used for these calculations, so density functional theory. But that would take me too much in, for this lecture here. So I will not do that, but especially because there are many students in the room that probably have courses where they have studied DFT already. I refer to our uh, Yuku site that is under construction, where you have one particular lecture about the basics of density functional theory. In that lecture of about 40 minutes, I explain in three different non-technical ways what are the essential ideas about density functional theory. You don't need any mathematics for that, but everything what is said there is absolutely correct. So it's a conceptual way to teach density functional theory. So if you want to have that view on the method, feel free to go there. And here I will jump to the other way of high throughput computation, which is the scheme we use ourselves, which is now high throughput computation for non-existing crystals. So what is the idea here? You start from assuming a crystal prototype, an underlying crystal lattice, and here I symbolize this by a two-dimensional BCC lattice. So you have space for atoms on the corner of this square and an atom in the center of this square. And you decorate this with the elements you want, here blue and yellow elements. You do a DFT calculation, and then you decorate it differently. You do the DFT calculation, decorate it differently, and so on. You scan a lot of different decorations of that lattice. That's the idea we will try. Where will we search now in this space of different materials, in this space of unknown crystals? Our target will be the quaternary materials, the one with four different elements, because this is at the rightmost edge of the zone of crystals we know. Binaries, we know almost every binary crystal that is possible. Ternaries, well, probably we don't know yet one half of all existing ternaries, but we know a lot. Quaternaries, that is the next step where there is much more unknown than there is known. So that is the right place to search. We will avoid the places where too many people are searching. So if I can use the Westlake as an illustration for this, there might be small areas in the lake where a lot of people are fishing. In our case, not for fish, but for new materials. People who are studying uh, max phases, Heusler phases, thermoelectric materials, these are uh, popular topics in the search for new materials. We avoid that competition 
and we go to places where fewer people go, where we have a larger area available, and we will search for our new materials there. But we will not do that too blindly. You can just, you could just take a random crystal structure with a random collection of elements and start calculating. Well, probably the chance that you find something useful is rather limited. So we will search an island where we know some information and we will then search in the environment of that known island. And our known island will be the quaternary zintel phases. So I have to explain probably in a few words what a zintel phase is. That's a type of chemical bond. It's a family of chemical bonds where in one crystal you have clear ionic bonding and also clear covalent bonding. So it's a crystal where ionic and covalent bonding happens simultaneously. There are several hundreds, maybe a few thousands of such crystals now, most of them with two and three different elements. If you look in this crystal databases, what are the crystals with four different elements that are zintel phases, then you see as a function of time this behavior here. Up to 1990, there was almost none of such crystals known. And then there were gradually more and more discovered. This is not the number of discoveries per year, but the total number of crystals. So right now, humanity knows about 200 different quaternary zintel phases. And you can extrapolate this curve if we keep searching as we are doing. And by 2030, we will know about 400 of them. Our goal is to break that trend and to discover many, many more of these quaternary zintel phases. So we have to build our search space and we will take four crystals with four different elements that are chosen from these colored areas. We take always at least one from the alkali and earth alkali block and two or three from the early P elements. That is because zintel phases are almost always built by elements from these blocks. So that, was our, that defines our element search space. If we look to these 200 existing quaternary zintel phases, then you can notice that there is one stoichiometry that appears rather frequently, the 1114 stoichiometry. So let's take that one. Let's search for new zintel phases that have that same 1114 stoichiometry. And within the 1114, there is one crystal structure that appears more often than others, and that's one with space group PNMA. There are six uh, quaternary zintel phases known with that stoichiometry and that crystal structure. You have all six of them listed there, and the example I take is potassium lead phosphor sulfur. That is an experimentally known quaternary zintel phase. It has been, oops, yeah, that's the crystal structure of it. So it's an orthorhombic crystal. You have this tetrahedra of phosphor surrounded by sulfur. There are potassium atoms dispersed into that structure and lead atoms dispersed into that structure. This particular one has been discovered in 2006. I show you just the abstract of the paper. And I show this to illustrate that finding a new quaternary zintel phase is the reason to publish a paper. Finding just one is sufficient to publish a paper. Maybe not the most cited paper you can imagine, but it's a, a viable topic to publish in the scientific literature. Keep that in mind. So what will we calculate for this? all these quaternary zintel phases? We will first geometry optimize them. So let vary the volume and the shape of the unit cell and let vary the positions of the atoms into this, in the unit cell to have the predicted geometry by density functional theory. 
Then we know the total energy for that optimized structure. And we will compare that total energy with the total energies from the individual elemental materials. So we take the potassium crystal, the FCC lead crystal, the phosphor crystal in its ground state, the sulfur crystal in its ground state, and compare the energy with the one of this quaternary crystal. Because this is one of these stability conditions. This crystal here must have a lower energy than the sum of all these energies. If not, it will decompose. So that's the first thing we, imagine, uh, we examine, the elemental formation energy, decomposition into the elemental crystals. And that will give us a lot of numbers that we will have to visualize in some way. So I will walk you now through the way how we visualize the information from these thousands of crystals that we have examined. So I start from the periodic table with the sets of elements that we have. In this particular case, for the 1114 stoichiometry, we took one element from the alkali earth alkali block, two elements from the first half of the P block, and one element from the group with sulfur, selenium, tellurium, and polonium. So we keep working just with these three blocks. I will take as an example all the ones that have sodium in the first place and combined with in the last place sulfur. So we forget about the middle block for a while. So I have sodium at place one, sulfur at place four. And now in the middle, I have two elements I have to choose from this three by three block. Let me, from this three by three block that you have here. So we have 12 times 12, 144 different crystals that both have sodium and sulfur. So for these 144 different crystals, we calculate the elemental formation energy and I take the lowest one of these. And the lowest one of these, I put in that square here. So this blue color code reads from this temperature bar, what is the elemental formation energy of the most optimal crystal in that set of 144. That we do for all elements now in this block. So not just sodium, that was here, but for all Eight. So what you see here is a combination of eight of these rectangles, always color-coded with, so each of them represents 144 different crystals, and you color-code it with the energy of the most optimal crystal in that set. And that you now do not only for sulfur, but the same story for selenium, for tellurium, for polonium, which are these blocks here. So that gives a first view on what is happening. The most negative formation energies, the most stable crystals are the blue ones. So that's at the sulfur side. And the deeper you go in this group in the periodic table, the higher the formation energies become. And the red region where you have the ones that are unstable that will decompose in the elemental materials, they are only found in the polonium region. Now, we can make a histogram out of that. I can take all my about 4,500 crystals that are in this set. I can plot their formation energy as a histogram of the formation energy. And you see that only a few of them are really unstable against elemental decomposition. And if I look at the six known ones, the six that were experimentally discovered already, they have formation energies in this region. So this potassium sulfur, uh, this potassium lead phosphor sulfur is there with a formation energy of about minus 0.6. That is just the elemental formation energy. That's one of these conditions that were given by the Bell number. We have to examine also the other ones. We have to see, are there other crystals in which this one can decompose? Binary crystals, ternary crystals, combinations of binary and ternary crystals. 
And these are already available in that materials project site. If they are experimentally discovered, they are there. So we can borrow the energies from the materials project site, apply them to this case, and we find that, in, that this experimentally known crystal is indeed stable against any decomposition in binaries and ternaries that is available in materials project. For luck, this confirms that our methodology is sound. If we would have found that an experimentally known crystal, according to DFT, should decompose, then we would have had a problem. I take another one that is not experimentally known, or perhaps not yet experimentally known. I don't know. So potassium lead gallium sulfur 4. And if we do here the same story, then we find that this one is unstable. If you take the ternary crystal with potassium gallium sulfur 2, the binary crystal lead sulfide, and the elemental crystal with just sulfur, then this combination has a lower energy than this quaternary crystal. So the chances that someone ever will find that particular one are very small. That we do for all the 4,480 crystals that were in our set. And we find that 80 of them should be stable. So DFT predicts that 80 quaternary zintel phases in this search space are stable against any decomposition in binary and ternary crystals that we already know. It could be that there exists a ternary crystal that we don't know yet, and that would be a decomposition path for one of these. That's possible. But with the knowledge we have, that is the conclusion. And we know that there is some error bar on these DFT calculations. I will talk more about later this week about error bars. But so it's not because a crystal is slightly unstable that it wouldn't be possible in nature that it still exists. So if we allow a little error bar and include also the marginally stable crystals, we find almost 600 of them. So it can be that several of these will not really exist, but if you start from 600 good candidates, chances are high that you will probably find some 50 to 100 that will survive the experimental tests. So that is the information we give to the experimental people. This set of 600 or 80 crystals, that's a good set to start searching. If you try a synthesis of these materials in the lab, chances are very high that you will be successful. And remember, I told you finding one of these new materials is the reason to publish a paper. Here they have the chance to find immediately not one, but many of them. So this can really speed up the discovery rate. So we go from six known crystals in that search space to probably of the order of magnitude of 100. The feeling this gives to me is a feeling that remembers me about the story I heard once from a colleague who was involved in this Mars rover expeditions. He was a geologist and he told me, well, if you are a geologist, I like being a geolog geologist, he said, but it's a difficult topic because wherever you look on Earth, geologists have studied things already. It's very hard to find a new piece of geological information that is not yet discovered, that is new. While if you do geology on Mars with the data from these rovers, well, every stone you touch is new, has not been studied yet. So even if you are not very smart, if you are just a standard geologist, you can make new discoveries on Mars because you are the first one. Well, I have the same feeling here for this new set of materials. These quaternary zintel phases are, I can imagine no reason why they would be particularly special. But nobody has studied them yet, so whichever of one you take, you will be the first one who is studying that new material. And who knows, there will be maybe a special discovery waiting there. 
So that is the that is the thing we are then doing in the next step. I will not talk about this here. We take all of the good candidates, for instance, such as cesium, bismuth, germanium, sulfur, four crystal, and we calculate their formation energy. We calculate the band gap. So this one has a Konchan band gap of almost two electron volts. We calculate the band structure. We can search for special features in the band structure if somebody for some purpose would be interested in that. So we have a whole pool of virtual materials that we can search for the one with the properties you like for your problem. And if you really like it, then you can go to the experimentalists and ask to make that material and use it for your purpose. Does that take a lot of work? Yes and no. So the story I described here has been performed basically by one person, Karel Dumont, as a master thesis topic. So he worked during 10 months on this for his master thesis. Helped by Michael Sluits and Kurt Lejagere, a PhD student and postdoc in our group. And their help is of course essential. Michael has developed a high throughput system to send all these thousands of jobs to a high performance computer. It's not, you, you are not going to submit that one by one yourself. That just takes too much human time. You need a machinery to do that for you. So he has developed this with error catching features. So if a calculation crashes, that automatically it is replaced by another one or that the calculation tries to, to fix the problem that went wrong. So that was essential to, to speed that up. But with this machinery in place, one person having a good computer can do this set of work. I mentioned the computer. The, all these calculations are uh, equivalent to about 120 core years on a normal core you can buy today. So if you would send this to your laptop, it would be running 120 years to do what this machine did in less than in a couple of months. We are part of the Center for Molecular Modeling in Ghent University, so I take the chance to present the group to you as well. About 35 people that are doing computational work in many different areas of science, material science, chemistry, biochemistry, everything from the computational point of view. The central computing infrastructure of Ghent University has every computing cluster has a name of a Pokemon character, and that's why we are happily surrounded by all these Pokemon features. So let me wrap up. I try to convince you that the imagination of nature in finding new materials and materials with properties we could never expect, that this imagination of nature is really high. That there are probably a lot of materials, crystals, that have not yet been discovered. That if you want to discover them in a reasonable amount of time, that it's best to do that first with a computational approach in a high throughput way. And I have shown you an example where we can extend the knowledge based on six existing crystals to a set of order of magnitude 100 new crystals. That brings me to the end. So if you want to download the slides of this presentation, you can find them here. The presentation is being recorded, so from tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, you will find them also on Yuku if you want to watch it again or want to share it with colleagues. And with this, I'm ready to take your questions.